Hello and welcome to Planet Critical, the podcast for a world in crisis. My name is Rachel Donald. I'm a lecturer, a climate corruption reporter, and your host. Every week I interview experts who are battling to save our planet. My guests are scientists, politicians, academics, journalists, and activists. They explain the complexities of the energy, economic, and political crises that we face today, revealing what's really going on and what they think needs to be done. This is a critical time for our planet. It demands critical thinking. Click the subscribe button now and go to planetcritical.com to learn more. My guest this week is Brian Check, who founded CASI, the Centre for the Advancement of the Steady State Economy. Brian's a former conservation biologist who went on to become an ecological economist when he saw the devastation that industries and everything just sort of linked to the expansion of the economy was causing to national parks, to indigenous lands, to the planet that we hold dear. Brian joined me to explain the link between the economy and environmental destruction, laying out a really fascinating trophic theory of money, explaining how it's agricultural surplus that drives sort of technological progression, and we can't have one without the other. And so in order to have more and more technology, we're going to have to have more and more agricultural expansion, and that is going to demand more and more land. Bad news for the techno-fantasists out there, I'm afraid. Brian joined me just after COP15. We recorded this just before uh, the holidays in December. And thankfully, he was saying that the fallacy of economic growth is something that is finally being talked at at these conferences, thanks to people and organizations like him and Cassie. However, we still have a long, long way to go. I hope you all enjoy the episode. If you do, please share it far and wide. If you're loving the show, support Planet Critical with a paid subscription at planetcritical.com or on Patreon. The link is in the description box below. By signing up, you'll also get access to the weekly article I write inspired by each interview. Thank you to everyone who has signed up and is supporting the project. I'm a vehement believer in ad-free and open access content, so Planet Critical wouldn't exist without the direct support of the amazing community. Thank you so much to all of you who keep the project going every week. Brian, thank you very much for joining me on Planet Critical. It is a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you, Rachel. It's good to be with you. Before we get into steady state economy, uh, could you give listeners some background on your career? And then we'll Okay, head well, over um, I was a wildlife biologist uh, going way back to the 80s. And, uh, and then in the 90s, I, de- I was uh, working for the San Carlos Apache tribe in Arizona, they have the fourth biggest uh, Native American reservation in the U.S. And uh, and I noticed that the the federal programs that had converged upon the reservation were kind of uh, out of sorts in terms of what they were prioritizing. Uh, so I decided that I wanted. Sorry, sorry. What do you what do you mean by that? Well, so uh, at this on the San Carlos Apache Reservation, wildlife is spectacular like the biggest elk in the world for example come from the san carlos uh tremendous biological diversity from lower sonoran desert to uh, you know above ponderosa pine zone but instead they were uh focusing on like harvesting timber and cattle grazing programs and road construction out in the mountains and stuff and and uh it it seemed obvious to a lot of us there that instead they should have been focused on conserving the spectacular, extremely valuable uh, in many ways, cultural and economic uh, Mm. among them. And so, so I decided that I wanted to get into conservation policy at the national level. And then I went back to school uh, for a PhD in that and did a policy analysis of the endangered species act. And as part of that, I was looking at the causes of species endangerment in the United I'm going like this because there was a list. Uh, I developed this database of all of the federally listed species and then the causes of the imperilment for each one of them. And uh, at the end of the day, this list of causes of endangerment, it just struck me. It's a who's who of the American economy. And yet, oh, really? Yeah. But yet at the same time, we had these politicians uh, in major races, like running for president of the United States that kept saying stuff like, oh, there is no conflict between growing the economy and protecting the environment. 
And I just thought that was uh, way off base based upon what I had been intensively studying there for years at the University of Arizona. So I... Could it, so I sorry, can I stop you there again? And can you give like an example of uh, one of those policies that, um, that was obviously linking sort of wildlife destruction and these big players in the economy? Do you mean like deforestation and an industry? Yes, agriculture, logging, mining, mm. commercial fishing, mm. the extractive mm. sectors in general, energy, of course, energy development, mm. uh, and then the manufacturing sectors from the heaviest manufacturing that depends directly upon all that extraction, all the way up to the lightest manufacturing sectors. And, uh, and then of course, all of the infrastructure that you have to have as you build out these sectors of the economy, uh, you know, the, the water canals and the pipelines and the energy transmission infrastructure, and, and of course, roads. <laughs> Roads themselves are a major uh, cause of endangerment for a long list of species. And then, uh, and of course, pollution, you know, uh, you're not going to have economic activity without pollution. That's basic thermodynamics. That's the second law of thermodynamics. There must be waste. Uh, and so, uh, uh, and then you have, you know, outdoor recreation activities, some of the service sectors that, that occur in the outdoors, uh, and in the, you know, every economic activity requires energy and materials. And it doesn't mm. matter if, it, you know, people have this fuzzy notion that if you try to have more and more service sectors, you're somehow going to dematerialize the economic activity. Yeah, that was always nonsense because what do the service sectors serve? For the most part, they serve the goods sectors. All those activities that you know we just went through a little agriculture, logging, mining, etc. Yeah. That's what they serve. And then when they serve the consumer uh, directly, they're in no way dematerializing either. You know, I like to use an example. Uh, for that the entertainment sector is one of the biggest mm -hmm. uh, service sectors, right? Well, in the USA, you have NASCAR as one of the biggest mm -hmm. segments of entertainment. And there's nothing it, that's possibly more material uh, uh, wasting than, than NASCAR. And of course, NASCAR has its international analogs as well. <clears throat> mm-hmm. So anyway, yeah, so, so the causes of endangerment, I noticed were a who's who of the American economy, and yet we had politicians saying there is no conflict. And so I went into ecological economics at that stage. That was in the late 90s. Uh, ecological mm -hmm. macroeconomics, I like to specify, the economic growth theory. Uh, you know, and I studied it both from the conventional angles as well as the ecologically uh, informed angles in ecological economics. And, uh, you know, and I, and I've written several books about it. Uh, and then, and then I signed on with the U S government in the headquarters of the U S fish and wildlife service in 1999. Uh, and I was the first conservation biologist by that title in the government. I mean, there were a lot of biologists that would have called themselves that, but, but the reason I mention that is the, that position was distinguished partially by the fact that I was supposed to bring into it big picture, long-term issues and thinking and, uh, you know, proposals yeah. and planning. And that was a natural fit with the ecological macroeconomics background that I'd been, you know, developing. Uh, but after a certain amount of time, they didn't want to have anything to do with that. Uh, when it came out that there was a conflict between economic growth and the mission of the agency, which is wildlife, wildlife conservation, they, uh, started backpedaling from the big picture, long-term part of the conservation biology program. 
Okay. Okay. And and who is they exactly? Which which government are we yeah. talking about here? So the U.S. government, the U.S. Department of the Interior, which has agencies like uh, the National Park Service. Uh, the, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, but which administration? Well, that administration was still the last term in the uh, Clinton Clinton administration, the last year. Right. But it was about to roll over into the Bush administration in like my mm-hmm. second or third year there. Uh, but mm-hmm. to be honest, Rachel, I don't think that the, the pushback against ecological macroeconomics had much to do with who was in office. There was a bipartisan uh, mm-hmm. notion or bipartisan political rhetoric that you could have your cake and eat it too, that you could grow the yeah. economy and still manage to protect the environment, including, yeah. you know, biodiversity conservation. And it, it, it's, it's totally fallacious, but it's politically powerful. And it especially was at that time. <clears throat> I think we're uh, making a lot of progress on excising that, that fuzzy notion from the American polity and, and, uh, governments around the world more so in europe i mean you know there's a lot of insight i think by now in in europe with the degrowth movement Mm -hmm. and and frankly in in the so-called developing world you know where you still have a lot of uh common sense i'm going to call it and and original uh native or even aboriginal you know sorts of thinking and uh, worldview that recognizes that, you know, the nature, the economy of nature, if you will, uh, can't, doesn't do well if the human economy is squeezing it out of existence. Totally. I think it's worth, um, talking about COP15 at this moment because we are recording in the week of uh, COP15, 19th of December. Yeah. Um, and the push to protect biodiversity is this 30 by 30. So protect 30% of the world's land mass by 2030 in like national parks so that they can't be co-opted by industry uh, or government. And it's been a real push from like Global North governments to get this done. However, there's a lot of pushback from indigenous cultures saying that this is another land grab. Um, because if you create national parks, you're essentially taking territory away from indigenous peoples who have been stewarding that land for a long, long, long time. And I think in terms of what you're saying, it, it seems like it's a bid to splice the world. Like, okay, so we'll protect 30% of it, but then we can use the other 70 to keep growing the economy as much as we want. And unlimited right. growth is feasible and now sustainable because we're protecting a, a little bit over here. Uh, could you comment on that? Yeah. Well, it's good timing because I just got back from COP15 last night, in fact. Yeah, right. I was up there for like Amazing. two weeks. And we had this little message. Yeah, this is the Cassie logo here. Let's see if I can do this uh, backwards, sort of. Yeah, you see the economy, <laughs> yeah, the economy growing, yeah. you know, uh, and it's yeah. taking up more and more of the planet. So the idea yeah. is to try to stabilize that amount of economic activity and leave some of the planet for biodiversity. It that's mm-hmm. our logo at Cassie. Uh, and Cassie is Center for the Advancement of the Steady State Economy. Yeah, that's a and I should back up just a, for a minute. So that's a nonprofit Please? that that I established while I was working for the government uh, because I started to get these gag orders that prohibited me from even talking about the conflict between economic growth and environmental protection. So really from your employer? Yes. Oh, yep. how interesting. Yeah. Re- and in what respect? As in like you couldn't speak to a journalist about your concerns about economic growth and conservation. Correct. I couldn't speak to any, but by the end of my uh, tour of duty with the government, I couldn't speak to anybody, <laughs> even in the halls, theoretically, about about this. Uh and so in twenty seventeen oh, I quit to run Cassie full time. So, uh, so I, you know, would be able to speak truth to power about, about this and, uh, 
But anyway, so when I went up to COP15, I was representing mm -hmm. Cassie and, and you do have the 30 by 30 initiative. You also have a, a substantial uh, presence. There was a substantial presence at COP15 arguing for half Earth, saving half the Earth, and which is kind of, okay. it fits our logo pretty nicely, you know, just kind of yeah. by the way we designed it, that's half of the Earth. But to your question, that is a huge question. I mean, just from both sides of the coin, so to speak, just because you have an area protected, quote unquote protected, doesn't mean that it's going to be great at conserving biodiversity. If it's, uh, yeah, if there's too much activity on a too much recreational activity, for example, uh, mm -hmm that a lot of the biodiversity conservation will be compromised. Obviously we have global heating that's, mm. you know, threatening every ecosystem, uh, on the planet, uh, whether, whether it's supposedly protected or not. So from that side of the, the equation, just because it's quote unquote protected doesn't mean it's, it's, uh, it has any ecological integrity, you know, or much. So, and can I ask, can I ask the conservation biologist in you, um, do we have data on which has more ecological integrity, these protected national parks or stewarded areas of wilderness by indigenous peoples? Oh yeah. Well, that's a great question. There, there are data, uh, about that here and there. Um, it's not something that I have, you know, cataloged or anything, but, mm. but from my own experience, yeah. going back to the San Carlos Apache reservation, I'd take that any day of the year relative to, uh, many of the, uh, well, certainly many of the BLM, you know, the Bureau of land management lands, mm. and also a lot of the, uh, national forest lands, the national parks, uh, <laughs> If they're not overwhelmed with traffic, they're pretty good. Uh, the big, the, the bigger national parks, you know, like Glacier, North Cascades, uh, Olympic National Park, mostly in the, the American West, uh, mm -hmm. they tend to do well. Uh, but, you know, then, then Rachel, there's a whole thing about, well, okay, these, these big northern refuges and parks they don't have the biodiversity in terms of numbers of species and uh and genetic yeah, yeah diversity as you have like in the global south with tropical ecosystems yeah. and that's kind of a different issue uh that's a comp that's a very very complicated issue because it, uh i don't want to use a, a metaphor that sounds too uh uh, uh to insensitive or something, but like if you have a burning library and, and you want to do your best at saving material, you all else equal, you want to head for like the, uh, uh, the tomes of antiquity, the huge books that were written long ago that have tremendous amounts of classics with tremendous amount of information. There's sort of a genetic analog to that. Uh, so these tropical regions where you have a gazillion insect species, for example, that are very, very closely related uh, genetically, they have such extremely specific niches in the economy of nature of the tropics. You know, I hesitate to uh, portray them in, in terms of that burning library, but they're not really the tomes of antiquity. The ecosystems at, at, as a whole are like, that would be like a whole wing of a library, you know? Mm. So my point there, what are the tomes then? Well, things like elephants, grizzly in general, the large body K selected species with the uh, lower rates of growth. Uh, the longer lifespans. Um, but what about 
I mean, the whole thing with like bees, you know, that that we all depend on bees and if bees were to disappear, then we'd all be, yeah, we'd all disappear too. Like surely ecosystems form such an, uh, an intimately uh, necessary function in, in, in the ecosystem. We might be getting off track here, but. Well, that, we are, but that's a little <laughs> different thing. You know, that's what you're talking about. You know, that's sort of the concept of the keystone species. And uh, yeah, okay. that's like a like a different part of the library that's also extremely important uh, in its own right. You know, it kind of helps to save the rest of it. Might, that would be like a book about fighting the fire of a library. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah it's, yeah. Uh, so th that's, why, that's why it's so important to save a considerable amount of land. And whether it's, you know, via having a, a tribe or indigenous peoples uh, function with their original culture uh, or simply uh, setting the boundaries and keeping the economic activity, keeping the bulldozers at bay, to put it simplistically. They're both way, way better options than this globalized bulldozing goods and services proliferating GDP obsessed economy. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was uh, listening to the radio the other day um, just because it was on in my, in my aunt's house and it was Radio Scotland. And um, gosh, you know, I can't even remember what the show was, but these two commentators were talking about the Scottish economy and how it's in a bad way. And the word that they used the most was growth, 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 growth. You know, we have, we don't have enough growth. We need to have growth. Um, we need more young people so that we have growth. We need um, to uh, have growth to attract more young people and all that. And like, it just, nobody asked the question about whether or not growth is even necessary or what, what we mean by growth, because the economy has been growing for decades now. Um, certainly the past 10 years, the economies have been growing and quality of life has been going down for very many people. People are losing their jobs, they're losing access to housing, they're losing education. So mm -hmm. let's assume, for certainly for listeners of this podcast, like we don't, growth is a, is a fallacy, as you said. Um, it's the wrong assumption. Um, but still, I think it's very difficult for people to think about what, what comes after growth. And degrowth has been very interesting, but I'm particularly interested in this idea of a steady state okay. economy right. uh, because we have growth and then degrowth is kind of like the contraction and we will need a contraction in terms of our energy use and materials use. But how do we create something that is a steady state in something that's in stasis? Yeah, uh, It seems that humankind is particularly maladroit at uh, stabilizing things. Right. Yeah, well, um, I noticed when I was in the green room before the before this started. <laughs> is there like an option to? Can I share the screen? And yes, you can. Uh, Wendy did this recently. I didn't know what you're talking about. Is sort of this these different options? Uh, uh, and I, I do want to say that there's no question about what growth is. Economic growth is simply an increase in the production and consumption of goods and services in the aggregate. That's a really key phrase, in the aggregate. So it's not necessarily more solar panels here and less internal combustion. Engine. You know, it's more and more stuff as it's totaled up into the calculation of GDP or gross domestic product. Of, value of the final uh, goods and services. And, uh, yeah. but no matter what, that GDP growth entails a growing population and or per capita production and consumption of goods and services. And so, yes, as you indicated before, degrowth is pretty much the opposite of that. Now, don't forget you, you have a European degrowth movement that they uh, 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 like to capitalize the D and degrowth and, uh, and remind us that it's a whole political movement that encompasses much more than simply this process of degrowing GDP. But for our purposes, you know, the small D degrowth 
It's just uh, a, a decreasing GDP. And, uh, and so then, yeah, the steady state economy is the thing in the middle. Uh, so we know that growth isn't sustainable because it's going to exceed the carry, the ecological carrying capacity of the planet or of any country. And, uh, and of course, then degrowth isn't sustainable for sure. And so the, the sustainable well, option is that steady state. Okay, let, let's pause here. Um, and I'm going to walk us through the graph as well, because we have some people who are listening just on audio here. Um, so if you could bring the graph back up for me. Okay. Thank you. So this assumes that the steady state economy would start from where we are. And I think, I mean, I would like to question that because from what I understand of degrowth, it's that we really need to rapidly contract our energy use, our material use, and therefore that would contract our economies. Yeah. Um, but you don't contract into nothingness. <laughs> At one right. point, uh, I imagine you plateau and you would have your steady state there. Yes. Excellent point. Because surely, surely for your steady state economy, we would need to contract first. Yeah. And so when... By the way, this is a talk I gave at COP15, and that becomes a major topic towards the end. It's a topic that I, that I would refer to as the ultimate challenge for uh, democracy in the 21st century, because that's right. Uh, you, you, it's not necessarily the place to start is the current GDP. It probably is in some countries, but it certainly isn't in, in, in very... I'm going to call them, uh, well, I'm going to call them obese countries, okay? Uh, yeah. Very rich, very wealthy with a lot of fat in the economy. USA would be, you know, toward the top of that list. Uh, so those countries, they're way unsustainable based upon their ecological footprint. So some level of degrowth is probably the, the best uh, option for those countries. And... Uh, and yeah, so what's the optimal level of GDP is what we're faced with as a huge question going forward. And for a lot of us, you know, the economy is way too big. Those of us that really love wild country, a lot of wildlife, uh, nice, clean water and clean air, a lot of, you know, room to roam, solitude uh, and all that. But then you do have a lot of people that, they wouldn't mind if the whole planet was like a New York City you know, or an Amsterdam or Bangkok or whatever. So that's the that's the challenge is to is to uh, move toward a more optimal GDP, both among nations or within nation states and among the international community and to seek what we might call a, a democratic optimum. Why, why continue to even use GDP as a measure? Well, that's a great question. And uh, it, let's put it very simply, going back to that, the issue of, of, of obesity in an economy. Uh, if, you have, if you're a doctor, a medical doctor, and you have an obese patient, the last thing you're going to do is to tell that patient to throw away the scale. In fact, oh, okay. if anything, they need to monitor that scale more attentively than ever. Now, they have mm -hmm. to also use a blood pressure cuff and a stethoscope and other indicators of that patient's health. They have to pay attention to those things more as well. Uh, but the last thing you want to stop doing is measuring the size of the economy. Otherwise, you really don't have any chance of finding the right size of the economy. You've got to be able to measure it. And GDP is an outstanding metric, an, an outstanding measure of one thing. Well, two things. It's an outstanding measure of two things, the size of the economy and also the environmental impact of the economy. And also our energy right? Yeah. Because it's one for one on, um, oh, do you know, I've forgotten, I've forgotten the, I, the metric for, hang on. It, well, there's the ecological energy. footprint. Uh, I mean, the, the GDP is 
practically one and the same as the ecological footprint. It's telling it's, you it's that one the bigger it's getting, I mean, yeah, the more of the planet you're chewing up. So it's also GDP is also one for one with with energy use in in nations. So it's a great tracker for for how much energy we are consuming. And as you said, it, with the second law of thermodynamics, when we're consuming energy, we're also producing waste. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I wasn't aware of that. It, that probably is kind of a global average one for one. You know, there are places yeah. where you, there's a lot of waste and you can get more efficient, but not that the key thing is you only get more efficient per capita. That doesn't mean you're using less energy or still using more of it as the economy grows. Yeah, you can get a little more efficient, you know, for the economists out there that might, they might think of the old uh, Jevons paradox, <laughs> yeah. uh, but it's not that paradoxical when, when we study the relationship between economic growth and technological progress. I don't know if you want to get into that, but. Yeah, I want to get into everything. Oh, man. <laughs> we have to do this again then. <laughs> I mean, I've had I had a Kerry King on the show about, um, gosh, a, a year ago now, who really went through Japan's paradox um, and why the more efficient we make machines technologically, it doesn't make um, our energy use contract because we just then produce more and more and more machines and are constantly updating them and people have more access to them. Um, so efficiency is sort of a myth and using efficiency as a metric for sustainability is just silly. Yeah. Uh, the thing that gets overlooked systematically or systemically is that uh, technological progress isn't manna from heaven. You know, it mm. requires, especially at this point in history, when all of the lowest hanging thermodynamic fruits have been picked, you know, the easy oil wells, the gold nuggets lying along the shoreline of, around Nome, Alaska, you know, easy picking resources. When that's over and you have to resort to things like tar sands mining, for God's sake, in Alberta, and, you know, Nord 2 pipelines coming from the Russian uh, Arctic, you know, to, and causing wars and stuff. But when it's like that, uh, you... Uh, your your efforts to get more efficient via technological progress, there's diminishing returns to scale of the R&D enterprise, the research and development. Mm. And furthermore, for you to spend money on research and development in the laboratories and in the field, uh, well, how does that money come about? And this is, by the way, this is one of our specialties at CASI, the Center for the Advancement of the Steady State Economy. We had, we uh, proffer this thing we call the trophic theory of money, which is that you don't have any money originating unless uh, or additional money into the money supply and into the macroeconomic flow of GDP. That doesn't happen without additional uh, surplus at the trophic base of the economy. And that's where the agricultural and extractive activity occurs. You have to have more surplus there at that base to free the hands for the division of labor onto the, the other higher trophically leveled, you know, uh, sectors like all of the manufacturing from heaviest to lightest and the service activities as well. So it kind of so backfires need... is what I'm trying to say. When you're trying to uh, conduct research and development in order to, to get to conserve resources, you had to expend more natural capital and ecosystem service funds at the base. <laughs> and so you're always starting from kind of a losing, uh, a losing spot. I don't think I understand that. Could you, could you? Could, could we talk about it again? <laughs> could you explain okay. it again? I'm struggling. Okay. Yeah. So I've been talking about this thing called the trophic theory of money. And to start with, uh, we recognize that, let me put it into a better viewing thing here, uh, that in the economy of nature, well, 
there is no economy of nature unless you start at the base with the producers. These are plants that literally produce their own food via the process of photosynthesis. And when you have plenty of surplus by those plants, by those producers, then you can start to support uh, species. You can think of this in evolutionary time, you know, the, the uh, evolution of species for 4 billion years on earth. This is pretty much how it went. You know, you had plants, uh, to, to put it very simply, simply uh, once you had a lot of plant production, then you were able to support species and, uh, and many uh, populations of primary consumers, the animals that eat the plants directly. And then when there's uh, enough of those populations and species and biomass, then you can have the populations of secondary consumers, that is predators, essentially. And, uh, and in the, if you uh, include humans in this, then it makes a lot of sense to view Homo sapiens as occupying the top trophic level here. You know, you've got the plants, you pretty much have all the other animals. And you can put Homo sapiens up here by virtue of the fact that we people, you know, we can occupy just about any part of the planet. We can find, hunt, kill, harvest anything that's edible. And, uh, you know, so it makes sense to put Homo sapiens up here. Now, some ecologists will argue technically, since we're so omnivorous, you know, we should be more in the middle trophic levels. But for the purposes of at hand, it, it works well to uh, for the model to consider us up here, because then if you consider the human economy expanding, it's sort of a trophic compression of all the other species on the planet like that. See, so and that explained that goes back to when we were talking about the causes of species endangerment it's the economy squeezing out the other species here's another way of putting it you know economic growth it's a process of reallocating all the natural capital the wood and waters and soils and minerals and so on from the old economy of nature where where all this stuff had simply comprised wildlife habitats on over to the human economy where that that natural capital is uh converted into uh well manufactured capital and and producer and consumer goods and services mm -hmm. and yeah you know uh in the wildlife society took on this topic for a number of years and uh, this is where some of our activism at Cassie came into play because well, the, the professions, the wildlife and fisheries professions, they were kind of like susceptible to this win-win rhetoric that there is no conflict between growing the economy and protecting the environment. So they got into it back in the early 2000s and they figured it out and they published uh, special editions and stuff that describe the conflict between growth and, but to, mm -hmm. but to go back now to that trophic theory of money. So now we apply basic principles of ecological economics to the human economy. And we, we recognize that we too have a base of producers and it starts with the agricultural activity. Which is very interesting because, see, that's the tight linkage with, with the original economy of nature where plants were the producers. Here we have farmers working with plants to produce surplus food. In this case, though, for one particular species, Homo sapiens. But we can also put the extractive sectors at this base as well because what it's all about is the production and surplus of food, clothing, and shelter. And once you have enough of that surplus, well, then you can start into the heavy manufacturing, you know, and you can think of this evolutionarily with, uh, you know, some of the earliest heavy work out there, you know, like, uh, oh, yeah, 
Why can't I? Like, so, so we're talking about, like, so you have to produce the food to feed the humans who can make the heavy duty machines, who can, like, build the factories. And then it's in those factories that you can, like, create robotics. Yes. And it's like robot and like computers. And then you have to train, you know, algorithms to make computers think. And it's just this like refinement of technology all the way up. But you cannot get every it's it's not a chain. It's a pyramid. You cannot yes. get to, uh, to the top level without passing by all the other levels first. You got it. And, and you started talking then about the, you know, the algorithms and the people working in the service sectors, the the mm. particular, the so-called information economy and you know, computer-centric service uh, provision. And that goes back to the point we raised earlier whereby, well, what are those services used for? And primarily, they go back into these activities. Mm. Uh, but anyway, so this trophic theory of money is that, yeah, money originates via the agricultural surplus that frees the hands for the division of labor. And by the way, I want to point out, we didn't just, you know, yeah. make this up. Uh, we've applied some principles of ecology to, uh, you know, to make this a more rigorous theory. But the, the, uh, this was suggested as long ago as, as Francois Quinet, the original economist in France <laughs> in the 1700s, and, and Adam Smith. In chapter four of the Wealth of Nations, you know, wrote briefly that the origins of money are an agricultural surplus. But it's really important because uh, before we get any of this kind of activity, the, the lightest manufacturing that grades or directly into the information economies, there's got to be a lot of this kind of activity. That's the principle of... Uh, 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 I forgot what we call it in ecology now, but you lose about... And you get that kind of activity is agriculture, land management, deforestation, lo logging, mining, extraction. Yes. Yes. You have to have a lot of this at the trophic base to have such extremely refined, as you put it, uh, you know, activities. And so the primary corollary of the trophic theory of money is that the quantity of money and GDP as the macroeconomic flow of money indicates the amount of agricultural surplus and extractive activity at the trophic base and therefore the environmental impact of the economy. So we can view it like this, you know, as the economy grows, that trophic base has to expand and it's not only in terms of acreage, it's largely in terms of acreage, but it's also in terms of intensity per acre. It's got to expand. And so you lose biodiversity, you pollute, you lose green space, you impact the environment in so many ways. Because of agriculture and extraction. So hang on, let's pause there though, then, because that's really, that's really, really interesting because obviously I'm... Um, Concerning the climate crisis, one school of thought is techno utopia. I'm um, that technology is going to save us all. We're we're just going to figure out a way to a sort of reverse the impacts of climate change and b maybe feed everybody um, with like lab grown meat and this kind of stuff. But you're saying that like that like top echelon of technology that people typically think will save us from the impacts of climate change fundamentally cannot be reached without in environmental impact that is causing the climate crisis. Exactly. They're linked at the hip. Uh, the growing impact caused by uh, the growing economy using current levels of technology and the mm -hmm. development of supposedly problem-solving new technologies. It's a, neg it's a negative sum game when you when you uh, account for the laws of thermodynamics because there's waste in the process of converting that surplus to technological progress. Um, and by the way, you know, there's this notion that somehow we're going to be able to select right. for, always select for the most efficient processes out there. That's also nonsense. Uh, in, in physics, there's a thing called the maximum power principle 
that applies perfectly well to uh, economic activity, whether it's capitalist or socialist. Uh, it's not maximum efficiency that's selected for because maximum efficiency is slow. It's slow to develop. It doesn't get things to the market as quickly or into the households or into the government as quickly. Uh, it can't be so uh, fast that it's reckless and exceedingly wasteful, you know, wantonly wasteful. The winner in competing between those super fast and wasteful and super slow and efficient processes is right in the middle. The, that's why, uh, you know, in the maximum power principle, most uh, power, that is work, most work gets performed at 50% efficiency. So we shouldn't be, uh, you know, fooling ourselves that, that we're going to always be selecting for the most efficient means of production. What if, I recognize this is a bit of a technological question, but what if we redesigned everything with the maximum power principle in mind? Um, and rather than going for efficiency, went for, okay, well, we just need the 50, the work to work at 50% considering and design everything for that. Yeah. Well, that's a, theoretically that's going to help. Uh, but once again, then we're going to run into what we might call the trophic conundrum to get, if we're striving for ever greater, uh, total factor productivity in macroeconomic terms, you know, the efficiency of the economy at large, the efficiency of GDP. We have to then keep this uh, technological progress going. But as we have described, as we have discovered, you know, that is linked at the hip with a growing ecological footprint uh, because it requires more economic activity the economic activity using the current technological regime. So, yeah, maybe I, the maximum power principle has a lot of applications, especially when we think about the prospects for any sort of capitalist economies that don't really plan, as you say, for uh, selecting more efficient modes. But when we combine all these things that we're talking about, you know, the link at the hip with the planning for better efficiency, I think what it boils down to is a steady statesmanship is what we like to call it. Steady statesmanship in international diplomacy, where we recognize that some countries are overgrown and we need from them, with them, as part of them when we live in them. We need degrowth toward a more sustainable, steady state economy. And then with some of that surplus we have, converting some of that fat in the economy, the expenditures on NASCAR, for example, and the gazillionaires out there with mega, mega mansions uh, by the score, that some of that fat needs to be converted to helping in our international community countries with really dire poverty problems uh, so that they can get a, a leg up, you know, and and, uh, and their economies need to grow some. And then they also need to settle into a steady state uh, at some level. And so all this process uh, at large in as brought about through international diplomacy that's what we call steady statesmanship, and that's what we were pitching at COP15. Okay, so we are talking about degrowth for the global north until a, uh, a steady state and growth for the global south until they reach sort of a required level of development and redistribution. We're talking degrowth, redistribution, and then steady state. Yeah. Now... Kind of like this kind of a process of uh, trickle down consumption. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so, I mean, first of all, 
I suppose, what would that do to our technological process, uh, progress? And then, yeah, does, does that mandate that our technological progress stops here? You know, where we are, where mankind is at 2022, that's as good as we're going to get. We put somebody on the moon um, we can speak to each other across the world. Um, you know, that, that this is all we need. <laughs> we should be happy with what we've got. Um, yeah. Is that, is that what your model mandates? That's, you know, that's one of the million dollar questions, so to speak. Uh, and there are people like myself that say, yeah, that's probably the case. Uh, this rapid hmm. technological progress has been linked at the hip with that rapid GDP growth. And, you know, conventional economists out there, in other words, non-ecological economists, for them, it's puzzling why for the last couple decades, several decades now, really, that the increase in total factor productivity as the rate of increase has slowed uh, so noticeably, we're just not getting the returns from research and development that we used to in terms of getting more product. But that's not at all puzzling to the ecological macroeconomist based on what we've been talking about. But so the implication then is, I think, that when you settle into a steady state economy, let's say the whole planet does. We've, we've accomplished some degrowth in rich countries, some growth in poor countries, and now we have a global, we have steady statesmanship and in international diplomacy, and it's a fairly steady state planetarily. I think what you can expect is a very low rate of technological progress, and you might view it as sort of an evolutionary rate, like uh, you might imagine in uh, prehistoric days, a caveman family sitting around a, you know, the smudge fire in the cave or something, and some somebody's tinkering around, and, and something like a wheel starts to happen. Yeah, over, you know, and and maybe mm -hmm. uh, thousands of years later, there's somebody outside the cave with like some kind of little wheelbarrows. Very slow rate of technological progress based not so much on what happens in expensive research and development labs, but kind of what comes up in, in human minds. Hmm. And a lot that of that's already going to have occurred. You know, there's a hmm. real interesting hmm. philosophy of science book out there called the end of, called the end of knowledge or the peak of knowledge or something like that, that's related to this, where a philosopher, a, a biographer of philosophers interviewed a number of leading philosophers of science on this topic, like Karl Popper and, uh, I can't remember. It's been a long time since I read that book, but they, they mm. tended to concur with with what I'm proposing here, which is that the, the rate of technological progress would, the rate of, pro would wind down to something very, very slow. But that in a way that would take a lot of pressure off people of the world, you know, yeah. and it would fit so well with steady statesmanship where it's not about GDP growth getting more and more different kinds of stuff, more and more amounts of stuff out competing the others out there. Uh, hmm. it's, it becomes more than an art of diplomacy an art of culture, an art of getting along, you know, sharing. Yeah. I think it's an interesting and exciting vision because it also doesn't mean that we couldn't increase that rate at times when something was necessary. Like, yeah. you know, the sort of COVID, even though the COVID response diplomatically and politically was a nightmare, it is incredible that we got so many vaccines on the market so quickly. The problem was that there was a market for it and that there wasn't international collaboration. 
So it it means what what you're talking about the technological rate of progress decreasing. It means that like massive less consumption. You know, not you don't need a new phone every year. Nothing at all. We just get happy with what we've got. But still, there would be scientists and technologists around the world, probably state funded, who would be working on acute problems for the sake of mankind rather than for the sake of profit maximization, if and when necessary. That's a really great point, and that I think that needs to have a lot more thought put into it by a lot of people and yeah like punctuated technological progress where necessary uh yeah yeah, or crucial yeah well rationing and prioritizing resources it could create a fundamentally better world than the one where people are scrabbling about for what's available and getting far more than they need yeah i suppose the billion dollar question is how was this received at COP15? Oh, well, yeah, it it was fascinating because the conference was kicked off two Tuesdays ago, uh, largely by the UN Secretary General who referred to economic growth kind of indirectly, but not very indirectly. I mean, economic growth as... That is a reflection of humanity. Uh, He referred to that as a weapon of mass extinction. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, I I don't have the exact, but something like because of the obsession with economic growth, humanity has become a weapon of mass extinction. So, yeah. Uh, And then (laughs) early on at COP15, there were several outstanding sessions and uh, in fact i'm going to give a shout out to uh the organization called avaz led by oscar i forgot his last name and um and then also the organization cpaws the canadian parks and wilderness society which is uh snap i i think uh in french uh society of nature president so they They had their leaders and the mayor of Montreal and uh, the Cree leader of Northern Quebec, Cree tribe leader from Northern Quebec, and then a top uh, federal scientist or provincial environmental scientist on a panel that had a huge crowd, you know, uh, probably 400 people or so, huge for the sessions that, uh, you know, were not right in the negotiations. Uh, and they were actually pretty focused on this topic. Uh, and that wouldn't have happened even five years ago, I think. Such a focus on limits to economic growth and the costs of economic growth and the need to pursue something. So that was great. Uh, and, you know, I was there representing Cassie and and we got uh, the Cree leader to sign the Cassie position. The Montreal mayor has promised to consider it and think about an initiative where she uh, teams up with the Cree leader and they announce that they want to move toward a steady state economy. And then that spreads to a provincial movement uh, in Quebec and that spreads to a federal Canadian movement. And then that goes out into steady statesmanship and international diplomacy. We're always looking for some country and we found, you know, other potential places for that, uh, Bolivia, uh, you know, naturally some countries that are not currently in the big growth machine have special <laughs> yeah. interest in this. Uh, but then, but then Rachel, there were, uh, uh, less helpful things that happened toward the end, including a statement by the, uh, by the secretary of the CBD, the Convention on Biological Diversity itself, she said she doesn't believe there is a, a conflict between economic growth and but bi- Yeah, I, it was very <laughs> backwards uh, and very incongruent with what the U.S. Secretary General had to say. So I don't think I have that prop laying around here, but we, we did a quick press release and distributed those that... The title was uh, Secretary Marima is wrong. Guterres is right. And then we explained, mm-hmm. you know, uh, she she took a big step backwards uh, 
And then I, I was in some smaller sessions as well, where, well, where the usual suspects were, uh, misaligned, you might say <laughs> about yeah, yeah, the yeah. topic, like world bank, uh, some of the world bank oh, reps. Yeah. yeah. But all in all, I would say top 15 was a very helpful event in raising awareness about the conflict between economic growth and environmental protection. So I wouldn't get too discouraged. I believe that that recognition is spreading year by year in the COP, you know, in the COP arenas, climate and biodiversity. Amazing. I am so happy to hear that. And what a note to end on. Thank you so much. Brian, my final question for you is who would you like to platform? Well, you know, originally I would have said Herman Daly, or unfortunately he passed away yeah. uh, almost two months ago now. Uh, uh, maybe, uh, uh, gosh, there's so many greats out there in the, in the European degrowth movement. There's, uh, Tim Parikh, of course. I've had him. Had him. Okay. Uh, our ecological economist with Cassie, Greg Mickelson has a lot to say about like the rights of nature. Uh, let's see. There is Maria Mercedes Sanchez, uh, from Bolivia, who is a leader in the, uh, harmony with nature, harmony with nature initiative at the UN, which is very steady statish stuff. Oh, I'd love to speak to her. Yeah. She would be great. Brian, this has been so interesting. I'm sure we could speak all day, but I'm aware of the time. Thank you so much for making time for me and for introducing me and listeners to Cassie. Thank you so much, Rachel. Take care now. If you want to find out more about the steady state economy, I've put links to everything in the description box below. Remember to subscribe to this channel if you're new here and share the episode if you enjoyed it. If you loved it, support Planet Critical on Patreon, where you can also read my weekly essays inspired by each podcast interview. The Patreon link is in the description box below. As always, thank you to the Planet Critical community who support the show and make all of this work possible. Thank you all for listening. I'll see you next week.